Hey, this is Math 8, Unit 6, Lesson 2, Plotting Data. All right, number uh, activity one, representing data. Lynn surveyed 30 students about the longest time they had ever run. Andre asked them about their favorite color. Okay, so we have the longest time they've run and their favorite color. How could Lynn and Andre represent their data sets? Would they represent them in the same way? Why or why not? Well, they're asking about two different things, right? When you're talking about longest time, you're talking about a quantity, right? An amount, a number of sort here, okay? When you're talking about a favorite color, you're talking about a, what we call a category, okay? So that's not a number value, it's just what's your favorite color, red, blue, green, okay? And you could probably organize a category by numbers as well later on, but it's just asking how many colors. So when you're talking about a quantity, like Lynn's saying, it might be good to use something like a, you know, like a, a dot plot, something along those lines there. It might work for lens data, lens data. For Andre talking about the um, favorite color, he might use a bar graph, right? That could work where he had, you know, favorite color and he had red and blue and yellow. And he said, oh, this many are red, this many are blue, and this many like yellow. He could also use perhaps a pie chart, right? He could say this was yellow, and this was red, and this is blue. You can visually show that in a different way. For the longest times people run, you know, you might say up here, uh, you might have times, um, or either way, you could do the uh, times here, and you could say one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, five hour, and the number of people, one, two, three, and you could have, you know, number might be, you could do some dots here, different ways of showing that there. So different ways, depends on what you want to do, you have to think about, am I showing something that's a num numerical value, where I want to show dots and plots and things like that, or do I want to show it in a different way, okay? And I'll just make you, show you a little picture real quick. There are different ways we can do different graphs. We can use a histogram, which is a way of kind of comparing, uh, like this case is an example of some tree heights. I found this online, right? So here's some trees, the number of trees, and how many trees are in that 100 to 150 range? About that many. How many trees are between 250 and 30 centimeters? About 50. So if you were to measure a whole bunch of trees, you could use a histogram to show you how many were in a, a section or a range there. So like a scatter plot is great for showing the comparison between two values, someone's weight and someone's height. We saw that in our last lesson. A dot plot allows you to see like how many minutes does it take to eat breakfast. Some people, zero minutes, they don't eat one minute. And so you can compare just kind of one data point there, but at least it's a numerical data point on a dot plot. A table's a nice way of comparing two things. How much your score, how many, how often does it happen? How many people got score three, four times? Some people got four, score four twice. And another way you can compare things is with a, a box plot as well, where you have a low value, a high value, and you see kind of what that range is going to be and the numbers that kind of go in between there. So these are all different types of data plots you might use from time to time. All right, so here's our first activity. Now this first activity I really can't do online because you need a partner and you need a class. It says, uh, question, are older students always taller? Do taller students tend to have bigger hands? To investigate these questions, the class will gather data. A person's arm span is the distance between the tips of their index fingers when their arms are fully spread out, right? So here you are, and you measure from tip of the finger to the tip of that finger there, and we see how long is it from there to there, okay? The hand span, though, is the tip of the thumb to the tip of the little finger from here to here. And what you're going to want to do with your partner is you're going to measure that distance from how much is your arm span and find out how much is your hand span. And you're going to put that information into this box right here. So here are some sample numbers that I got from my book here. It said maybe partner one was 160 centimeters and his arm span was 157 centimeters. We got his height, his arm span, and the hand span it said was 19. And this person happened to be 162 months. Notice we're doing months, so do your year times 12, and then add, whatever that number is, add the other months you are old, okay, for your total. And partner B, it said was 152, 155 centimeters arm span, 18, and was 165. 
So using the data, we can see there's a lot of similarity between a height and an arm span. Those are numbers are pretty close. And we can see that the hand span seems to be the taller you are, your hand span is greater, right? So if this number is larger, we expect this to be larger. Does the age have any factor? Well, this person's older and the numbers are smaller. So age isn't always a factor in this here, okay? People grow at different rates and so that's not gonna work out too well there, okay? But height is definitely connected to arm span and hand span, but the age, not so much. And that's the idea there. So you wanna do that with your partner and see what numbers you come up with as you solve those there, okay? And then we go to activity three, which says now, what types of graphical representations could be used to show the class's height measurements? Make graphical representations of the class's height measurements. So what could you do? You could do a class representation and you could do the, um, just the number of people, okay? You could do a number uh, of people and the various heights down here. So maybe you had a range of between 60 to 70 and you had this many between 60 and 70. How many between 70 and 80? You might have this many. And again, you'd have some numbers here to choose from. And so you could use this histogram um, like so to be able to plot out how many were in each range there. That's one thing you might do, okay? Um, then you could also do it with a scatter plot. There's lots of ways to do that there. You get to decide what you want to do to talk about the measurements there. Then it says in part two, choose a color and use it to plot a point on the coordinate plane that represents your own height and hand span, okay? So if you did the height down here and you did the hand span on this side, you have to figure out how many squares you have to work with and how, how do you want to count these out. I chose to count them out by tens. So I have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130. And for the hand spans, I just counted by ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And if I just use the data points, oops, sorry about that, that I got from the book initially, I had a height of 160 and a hand span of 19. So I could say a height of 160, oop, need a little more, right? 130, 150, here's 160. And a hand span of 19 is somewhere about here. That's person A. And person B was about 152 and 18. So we go 152 and 18 about here. Now I only have two points of data. You, as a class, could definitely get some more people to probably plot some more points and you might find that your points look something along these lines here and you'll probably have some sort of line that shows that a taller a person is tends to have a greater uh, hand span there that a height is connected to hand span and you could probably make some predictions there of what do you think might happen and once you do this for each student in your class so if you're at home doing it on your own you can't do much maybe grab a brother or a sister or mom or dad and see what you come up with there okay all right so based on the scatter plot do you do taller students in your class tend to have bigger hands well we would say yeah they do the taller a person is the bigger the hand tends to be so is hand span a linear function of height so linear is going to mean this it means is it a straight line is it like one-to-one -one correlation and when we see here in our data and again if you have more you'll notice it's not a quite straight line you have things that are close to the line, but not straight on the line. For it to be linear, it had to be absolutely perfect, and it would probably also need to go through the origin as well, right? And start right there and be exactly perfect, which this one isn't exactly perfect. So we'd say no to that one right there, okay? Although the data may be accurate, displaying the data incorrectly can tell the wrong story. So what's wrong with these graphic representations? Well, in the first one, we have data all over the place, and we have a line. Now a line should show you kind of where things fit or if it's a what we call a line of best fit, like does it show a pattern or a trend? This line makes no sense. The data is all over the place and they just drew a line. It doesn't make sense. You don't see things increasing and decreasing. It's just pretty random there. So the line doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, where are the labels? What are we talking about here? I have no idea. So that's a problem with that graph there. On the next graph, the issues here are, well, 
We have very some, not very none. Okay, we know what they're looking at your interest in cars. But look at these data points. We have 25, 23, 26, 26. These numbers are all pretty close together. There's not like there's a, a two point difference between 23 and 25, but it looks like nobody likes some cars. No one has some interest because there's no value there. It's like non existent. And this is only a difference of one. And so because of how it's broken up there, it's it's very deceiving. It looks like not many people have no interest in cars. I mean, this is like 52% have not very much interest or no interest. So yeah, there's not very many, but there's still a lot that actually have some. If you look at this, you'd almost think no one wants a car, but it's just a poorly designed bar graph. And people do that in real life all the time. They'll adjust the bar graphs to make it um, appear one way when it really isn't because they maybe want to prove a point that isn't actually true. Okay, so with that in mind, our summary here says, histograms show us how measurements of a single attribute are distributed. So histograms work with a single attribute. Okay, so this is a histogram about dog weight and dog height. Okay, now a scatter plot though allows us to investigate the possible connections between two attributes. So a histogram is a single, but a scatter plot lets you compare two things there. And that's really what we're talking about today is a couple different ways of representing the data that might be available when you do a uh, little project and, and figure things out. Okay, we're going to pause there, stop there for today, and let you work on your homework. And we'll come back and check it together in just a few minutes. All right, here's homework for Unit 6, Lesson 2, Plotting the Data. In hockey, a player gets credited with a point in their statistics when they get an assist or a goal. So you get a point when you have an assist or a goal. The table shows the number of, of assists and the number of points for 15 hockey players after a season. So we can see their assists here, and we see the points that they earned there. It wants you to make a scatter plot of this data and make sure to scale and label the axes. So to make a scatter plot, we're going to have a y-axis and an x-axis like so. We can choose to put our assist down here, and we could put our points on this side there. It's important to take a look at our assist and say, well, where am I going from? I have 7 as a low number, and my highest number is 46. So I need to go from 0 to 46 there. So perhaps I want to count by 5s. So I have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 35, 40, 45. And that gets me a pretty good way to go. From a point, my lowest points I see I got a 12 there. That's my low point there. And highest I can see a 50, oh, there's a 58. So I need to go from 0 to 58. One thing our book does a lot of, it kind of skips to maybe starting at 12 or 10. I have space here to start at 0. I prefer, and most people who do graphs, prefer to do 0, 0 as a starting point. Sometimes you might see a little like a squiggle there to say I'm going to break the chart up and start at a different point. But typically we write them starting at the 0. But I know our book will skip and start at different points there. Um, and that's just what they do. So just keep in mind we like the zeros, but sometimes for space people, companies will write it in a different way. So we're going to go from 12 to, oh, 58. Nope, actually I have 72. My bad. That's the big one, huh? 72 is the biggest one. So let's count by 10. So I'm going to count by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So here's 70, and here's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Okay? So now I have the scale, and I have uh, the axis labeled there. And so then we can plot the points, right? So the idea is we say, well, 22 is about here, and 28 points is about here. And so we're going to plot these points out, 16 and 18, right about there, 46 and 72. Now that's one of our big ones way up there, right? Let's find a small one down here. Here's 7 and 12, somewhere about here, okay? So what do we notice so far with this chart? Okay, we can see if I plot all the points, there tends to be a line going this direction. Okay, the more assists you have, the more points you seem to generate. And that's what you'll see. Now, what I want you to do is to plot the remainder points here in your scatter plot there. So I want you to go ahead and do that on your own. 
Okay, I'm not going to plot all the dots there for you. <laughs> so select number two, select all the representations that are appropriate for comparing bite strength to weight for different carnivores. So how many things are we comparing here? We are comparing two things. And we talked before about when we compare two things, there are a couple different ways we might choose to compare those things. Now in our case, our choices here, we have a histogram. A histogram is great for just one item, okay? If I want to compare two things, a scatter plot is great, right? That's the X and Y, and it shows me how things relate, whether it be height with a weight or something like that. Or in our case here, we're talking about the bite strength and the weight of the animal, okay? A dot plot is not so much there because a dot plot's one thing, right? That's like the, uh, the weight. If the weight is here and I had numbers, how many dogs weigh one pound, two pounds, three pounds, right? That's not gonna show me a comparison between two things. This is a one item thing. A table is great, right? We could have uh, the bite and the weight and we'd have numbers to compare, that's excellent. And a box plot, again, is a way of taking this number here and instead of having the dots, you say, well, there's more over here and less over here, and we do like that. Box plot's great for one kind of value there. So we're gonna go with B and D. So when is it better to use a table? When is it better to use a scatter plot, okay? Well, a table is great when you're looking for very precise numbers, very precise data, okay? But a scatter plot is good when you're looking for a pattern, something that helps you see like it tends to be going this direction or going down. So scatter plots are great visually for a pattern. A table is great when you're looking for precision for exact numbers. And finally, number four, there are many cylinders with a radius of six meters. Let H represent the height and V represent the volume. Okay, so write an equation for volume as a function of height. So we know the volume of a cylinder is equal to pi times the radius squared times the height. In our case here, we're gonna say six for the radius. So we'll say volume equals 36 pi times h. Sketch the graph of the function using 3.14 as an approximation for pi. All right, so I'm gonna slide down here. We're gonna make a little graph. And we're gonna say right here we have one and two and three, okay? And this is gonna be our height right there. And what we'll do is we'll say, okay, if I have 3.14 as approximation of pi, okay, we're gonna figure out what the height's gonna be. So if I have a height of one, okay, so if the height equals one, then I have one times 3.14 times 36, which in our case is gonna equal 113, okay? Something along those lines, okay? Or 113.04, okay? So you can do the math there if you like. If I did it by two, two becomes equal to two times 3.14 times 36, you're gonna double that and you get 226.08. So let's just graph this out here. This becomes my volume over here. So I got a volume of 100 and then 200 and 300. And at one, with a height of one, the volume is about 113. So one comma 113. With a height of two, I'm at 226. So I have one, two comma 226. Right, and this can continue there. So you can see that there is definitely a pattern for the way that's going there. It would be linear in that regards. If you multiply the height of a cylinder by a third, well, let's go here. If you double the height of a cylinder, what happens to the volume? Okay, if you double the height of the cylinder, the volume also doubles as well. Because all we're doing is we're just doubling one value. It's not the squared value, we're just doubling the height, so it doubles as well. So height becomes two times the height, so everything is just gonna be doubled. We're not messing with the pi or the radius, which so just gets doubled. If you multiply the height of a cylinder by a third, what happens to the volume? Again, we would say it's a third, because instead of just multiplying by h, you're multiplying by one third of h. So everything gets reduced into a third. There's a decrease of a third. All right, that's it for today. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.